go back to the rotator cuff uh, now. So, uh, so here we're going to talk about impingement, uh, and then we're talking about pathogenesis of disease, and then we'll look at tendon changes. So, uh, pathogenic gear really start out with microscopic collagen tears, and then there are repair mechanisms which aren't perfect. And over many, many repetitions of this, you, lead, you end up having uh, breaks within the normal collagen uh, 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 matrix. Uh, and then this leads to reparative tissue and what we call degenerative disease. And you've all seen it on MR. It's uh, abnormal signal intensity, typically increased signal intensity, especially on the fluid-sensitive images. And uh, this leads to loss of mechanical integrity, and then that then leads to a position where you can tear the tendons. And in uh, studies in cadavers looking histologically, essentially 100% of rotator cuff tears are in the, uh, in the setting of surrounding degenerative disease within the tendon. So the degenerative disease comes first almost all the time. Uh, <clears throat> And the collagen fiber, as you know, is a triple helix. Embedded in this triple helix are water molecules, which we see here. And the water molecule is very tightly bound. Therefore, it doesn't move very much, which means there's a lot of magnetic inhomogeneity on these, which means they dephase very rapidly, uh, too rapidly for us to pick up a signal. And that's why normal collagen is black on all pulse sequences. Uh, and it goes, has a very short T2 time. Now, as we start getting breaks in these collagen fibers, uh, we, you start getting ad adsorption of uh, additional water on, on these areas of the break. This water has more motion in it, and therefore it averages out uh, field inhomogeneities, and therefore the T2 time lengthens in the water in these particular areas. So it starts being gray on short TE images, but in early disease, it's still black on T2-weighted images. So uh, early uh, degenerative disease shows a little bit of increased signal intensity on T1-weighted images or short TE images like PD images and also PD fat sat images, but on long TE images, it's still black because the T2 time is too short. When you get more and more degenerative changes, you start getting a lot of water uh, uh, buildup in these areas, and therefore it starts becoming bright on short TE images, even T1-weighted images and uh, gray on long TE images, unless you get to a point where you have a brain of frank uh, a fluid, uh, a macro fluid collection within the tissues, in which case it's bright on the T2, but dark on the T1. And that would be a situation like this. So uh, the, therefore, most rotator cuff disease is due to repetitive trauma, where you get biochemical breakdown of the collagen fibers, repair mechanisms produce tendinosis. Tendinosis then uh, causes loss of mechanical integrity, where you get partial tears, which correlates to full thickness tears. And also with this, you can get partial tears or tendinosis, which can try to heal by calcium deposition in some individuals and calcific tendinitis or calcific tendinosis is really part of a repair process in some people, and it's a repair of the tendinotic or partial tear lesions. And this is just a paper in JBJS a long time ago, which said that all torn tendons showed histologic evidence of tendinosis. So rotator cuff tears, uh, they're very common in cadavers. About a third of all cadavers will have partial or full thickness tears of the rotator cuffs. Uh, the articular size is more common than the bursal side for tears. That's different than what was thought 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the near pathophysiologic mechanism said that the primary cause of uh, rotator cuff tears was actually impingement from the acromium and acromioclavicular joint side. Uh, if that were the case, then you would expect uh, more, more tears to be on the Bursal side rather than the articular side, but that's not true histologically. The majority of tears are on the articular side where there's more traction injury uh, on, on the tendon. Overhead athletes, 40% have partial or full thickness tears at the time of surgery. So uh, uh, we also know that tears are more common in people who overstress those tendons. 
A little bit of exercise is very protective. It decreases the development of degenerative disease, probably because some degree of activity uh, causes the, the body to heal the microscopic tears more efficiently than if you have no uh, strain or stress on the uh, tissues at all. But if you have strains and stresses above and beyond the ability of the body to heal it in a reasonable time period, then you can go into partial tears or full thickness tears. So like almost everything in the musculoskeletal system, there is a sweet zone where enough exercise and activity is very beneficial. Too much or too little is actually harmful. So what does it look like on MR? Here's a P1 weighted image where we can see the, the supraspinatus tendon, a normal supraspinatus tendon, gray signal and the muscle, the muscular tendinous junction. We can see the, the different fibers of the tendon going into the muscle and the attachment side here. Uh, we can see a little magic angle artifact uh, where the uh, tendon comes in about a 40 degree angle with respect to the main magnetic field. On a T2 weighted image, that magic angle artifact pretty much goes away. Uh, typical normal tendon. When you start getting tendinosis, you start getting increased signal intensity on T1 and T2 weighted images. Uh, this was these slides are from many years ago when we were first trying to look into the, the signal changes uh, in these in these tissues. When we go to fat suppressed images. Uh, here we can see kind of a normal uh, fat suppressed image, a little bit of irregularity of the joint side surface. Here's a PD fat set where we're seeing some increased signal intensity within the tendon, showing tendinosis and a little partial tear of the joint side surface here. And this is an arthrogram. Okay. And then again, typical supraspinatus, T1 weighted image, T2 weighted image, PD fat sat image, and you can see these best on the PD fat sat, also on the T1 weighted images. But now we've dropped the T1 weighted images because it typically doesn't give us any more information than the T2 or the PD fat sat. And we typically go with the, the T2 and the PD fat sat. And I think I'll explain later why we've decided to go with T2 rather than T1. It's primarily to look for macroscopic tears where we have uh, pooling of uh, frank fluid in the in the tendon uh, to to see macroscopic tears. So typical tendinosis. Here's someone who has had a, an attempted repair of a supraspinatus tendon tear. <laughs> this shows uh, here's where the, the suture anchors were placed, <laughs> and this shows that we have uh, retraction of the tendon. So whenever you see an abnormal tendon, there are two things you need to look for. Uh, one is look for the location of the muscular tendinous junction. It should be right over the 12 o'clock position of the humeral head. If it's retracted medially, that's abnormal. And also the distal end of the tendon. And what we see here is that we have a breakdown uh, of, the co of the surgical construct. We have a complete tear with proximal retraction of the tendon and proximal retraction of the muscular tendinous junction. In this particular case, this is scar in situ, which develops because these tend to be relatively slow lesions. They start tearing, you get scarring, more tearing and retraction, more scarring, uh, and you end up with this scar tissue. And sometimes, if you're not careful, uh, people will misinterpret the scar tissue as intact tendon. And it does not function like intact tendon. It doesn't have the strength of intact tendon. And this is really a tear, and this would be a breakdown of the construct. We'll see more of these later. Uh, and uh, looking at the, the, the location of both the muscular tendinous junction and the distal end of the tendon can be very helpful and complicated, confusing cases. So that's the end of the tendon. That's the suture anchor. And that's the scar in situ. We'll talk more about that later. OK. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, so here we see the supraspinatus. Um, there's a lot of increased signal along the articular side of t uh, fibers. I think this is a pretty high grade tear of the supraspinatus. Um, there is some, uh, it, I think this might be scar in situ, but I'm just looking at the myotendinous junction. It looks actually to be retracted slightly and medially. So this might be a full thickness tear with in situ scarring. So this is full thickness tear with in situ scarring. That's good. And 
the way we know that is if this were just tendinosis, then this would be abnormal tendon coming down here, but the musculotendinous junction would be at the normal position. If this is a tear, then that means the tendon has retracted medially. And if that's the case, then you would expect that the musculotendinous junction would retract the same amount uh, as, the, as the tear size itself. And if you measure this, the tear size and the retraction of the musculotendinous junction are the same. So this is a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon with scar in situ and not just severe tendinosis with a high grade partial tear of the tendon. So locating the, the position of the muscular tendinous junction is key in differentiating this from a full thickness tear with scar versus a high grade partial tear. And you're, the, the patient is more likely to benefit from surgery if it's a full thickness tear with scar in situ. Though there are some surgeons that believe if you've got greater than a 50% partial tear uh, that those patients should be treated surgically. Personally, I believe in a few papers that have shown that, uh, that it may very well be that those patients who benefited from surgery didn't have partial tears, but misdiagnosed full thickness tears with scar in situ. So uh, I think it's important, and that's why you need to look both at the musculotendinous junction and the distal end of the tendon to differentiate that. So, yes. So I was wondering how can you differentiate that? between like a partial thickness tear with delamination and, and like kind of like a with just retraction of the articular fibers? Well, if you have retraction just of the articular fibers, then you'll only have the articular fibers retract. You won't have the entire muscular tendinous junction. And then here we can see the scar in situ. Here's the area of the tear with the scarring uh, above it. And you can see that even with scar in situ, you can have a water site seal where you don't have contrast going into the joint space. And therefore, uh, you, you have to be careful of these cases because in these cases, you could have a false negative arthrogram if you're looking at the arthrogram showing fluid going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Okay. Uh, and this is what this patient looked like at arthroscopy. Uh, well, and here we can see from the joint side surface, we can see that there's this big tear with proximal retraction. This is the end of the, of the tendon. This is that scar sitting above it when the patient was operated on, on 10-29-2010. So this was a full thickness, full width tear, and all this stuff back here was scar tissue. They then put the scope in the bursal side, and the bursal side, you see a lot of irregularity here, but you don't see a big defect. Uh, but this was all scar tissue you see here. When you go into the joint side surface, you can actually see that this is all scar, and this was just the, this was the tendon. So uh, uh, this, was, this was very helpful. So they knew ahead of time what they were getting into when they went in and they decided to resect the, the scar and uh, repair the tendon back to bone uh, with suture anchor repair. And that's the repair. And this was courtesy of Dr. Lou Yocum, who used to be the team physician for the angels. Okay, uh, Jennifer. John? Yes. Are, are you saying um, that this scar in situ was repaired? No, they, re they, they removed the scar in situ and then they took the tendon back up, they mobilized the tendon back to the bone and repaired the, the tendon to the bone, that they resected the scar. Okay, that, 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 that makes sense, all right. Okay, so here I see some mild increased signal intensity along the articular surface of the supraspinatus. I look on additional images, but I'm concerned that there's some partial thickness articular surface tearing. Um, the muscular tennis junction looks like it's in the normal position. Okay. This is when I was volunteering to be a volunteer in the scanner. We we're trying to trying some pulse sequences out here. So we can see a little bit of tendinosis here. So uh, uh, let's look at what happened nine years later. Mm -hmm. So here, 
there is a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus with some tendon retraction, and there is retraction of the musculotendinous junction. Scar in situ. So this is an uh, I'm a little bit confused when I go to some meetings because a lot of meetings people will say the most common location for a supraspinatus tear is actually in the mid insertion of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, my experience after looking at probably a couple hundred thousand of these cases is that by far it's the most common in the anterior insertion area. So I'm a little bit concerned at some of the meetings about that. This to me is by far the most common location of uh, where tears start. Uh, and they hurt. Okay, so this is 62107. Here are the other the sagittal images. Mm -hmm. So again, we can see a full thickness tear of the anterior supraspinatus, but the posterior supraspinatus fibers are intact. So uh, I was looking for surgery, and uh, on a Monday, on a Monday, on Sunday night, the surgeon called me up and said, "Let's try physical therapy and delay doing the surgery." Because that was Lou Yoakum. Okay, so we started physical therapy. So this is 62107. And then, so, so this is after two months of physical therapy. So it looks to me like that full thickness tear is similar in size. I don't think it's increased compared with the prior exam. And the muscular tennis junction is about the same as well. So I, I really wasn't a believer in physical therapy at that time. And uh, decided, well, I didn't want, want to rush into surgery, so I try it. But two months of physical therapy at this point, actually my shoulder was less painful than it had been in six months. So it was much less painful now. You don't really see that scar in sight too now. You just see uh, the full thickness tear of the anterior insertion, but I actually had minimal symptoms at that time. And then uh, another two months later, this is what it looked like. Okay, so I think there's still a full thickness tear, um, but there's no further retraction of the muscular tennis junction, and it's about the same in size. So at this point, after four months of physical therapy, I had no symptoms at all. Uh, the pain had gone away for the first time. In but, the but there is a scar in sight, too. Yep. But we're developing scar tissue here. And, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, it came back about 10 months later when I was completely asymptomatic, and this is what it looked like. So uh, the, the, the kind of issue here is this kind of healed with scar in situ, but why was the initial scar in situ I have very symptomatic, but this not symptomatic? And I don't really know. I only think that maybe the, the scar is different in quality uh, if you're exercising and it develops in a setting of, of uh, activity. Well, the scar doesn't have any uh, uh, neural fibers. Uh, so it, it, it's uh, how can we explain the intermittent pain and shoulder um, problems? Um, uh, we see that all the time. One day you have pain, uh, and then you don't have any pain for the rest of the week, uh, and then they may come back in six months or so. Depends on what you do. Uh, I have never been able to explain why people have pain in the shoulder. I have a, a, a torn shoulder cuff myself. I, I've never had an MRI, but I'm sure I have one. Uh, and uh, some days I have pain and some days I don't. It probably depends on what I do. Uh, the interesting thing here, okay, so this is at this time, uh, here is a few years later, and at this time, I've really had no symptoms. Now, what occurs around this time, however, is I stopped exercising, and after about six months, the pain came back again. When I started exercising, 
using the rotator cuff exercises, the pain went away. And as long as I exercise, the pain stays away. And uh, it, it's very odd. I would, I would have thought that directly straining a torn tendon would have increased the tear and made it worse. Uh, since this happened, I got the same problem in my other shoulder about two years ago. And now as long as I exercise uh, on a routine basis every week, I'm completely asymptomatic. So uh, I don't quite completely understand. John? I, I, I um, never could understand the, the reason uh, for, for the pain um, of the shoulder. Uh, sometimes uh, you don't do anything for a long time and nothing, and then you don't have any pain. And then, uh, like in your case, you carry a suitcase, uh, uh, and all of a sudden you have pain. Uh, severe, almost to the point of surgery, I remember. Yeah. Um, and all it was, it was uh, carrying a, uh, I think it was a briefcase, wasn't it? Right. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to explain. Um, and, and as far as the scar and sight to it, I, I'm not sure that, uh, I don't think I read anything in Campbell's, the new one about it, uh, but I haven't had a chance to really dig into the, the, the new Campbell's I just got. Um, I, 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 let's see what the orthopedic side yes. says about it. Good job. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Good, thank you. Okay, so six-year-old radiologist, shoulder pain and weakness. So it looks like there's a full thickness defect in the anterior supraspinatus fibers. Um, it looks like there's some sort of kind of low signal intensity along the footprint. I don't know if that's just kind of scar there or if that's kind of mid-substance tear of the fibers, but looks, we can see on the sagittal that there's, you know, full thickness. So we had a, a full thickness tear, a few surgery, and then physical therapy. We actually got better on the contracted time. So this is on 4-28-03, and uh, this is what it was like in 2009. So 09, so about six years later. I mean, we still see the full thickness defect, but now we see that linear signal, so it looks like there's some developing scar that's going to the footprint, kind of similar to the other one. And at that time, he was symptomatic. And so, and I don't quite understand why some will progress and go to full thickness tears and others will kind of heal. Again, it, it probably has, it has a lot to do with the biology of the repair of the body, the, uh, the kind of stresses and strains that goes over. That, that area. It's clearly been shown in a number of studies that strain actually stimulates healing, but too much strain causes tearing. So uh, again, that there's a fine line there, and it probably varies from person to person, and therefore it's very difficult often to, uh, to, to do studies because the same amount of activity in one person may be right in their sweet zone, where in somebody else, it may produce further tearing. So it's, uh, uh, you know, there's so much variability in the biology occurring here that it makes it difficult to uh, to really do good studies. Uh, the burst also makes um, it, it more complicated, but because the bursa has a lot of pain fibers, uh, that can set off uh, an inflammatory um, situation and becomes very, very painful. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. Uh, yeah. Someday maybe it'll, we'll, we'll have an answer to it. Yeah. So well, let's talk about partial tears now. So you can get acute muscle strains or tear. They're typically at the muscular tendinous junction, usually in younger athletes. You can get tears at the muscular tendinous junction, partial tears. You can get transverse or longitudinal partial tears within the tendon proper. And then you can get partial tears at the insertional foot plate uh, of the tendon. You can grade these, the uh, Elman grade, 
Uh, if they were uh, less than three millimeters, uh, it was called a grade one, uh, three to six, grade two, uh, grade three or greater than six millimeter tears. Uh, John, did you use this system? Was an element at UCLA? Um, yeah, he's written up in, uh, in Campbell's also. Uh, he's mentioned uh, in, 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 uh, in, actually, he's mentioned in um, an examination uh, of the shoulder and some type of technique of his, uh, but uh, I, I don't remember seeing this. Okay. Um, and then more recently, people t tend to divide partial thickness tears of the, of the rotator cuff into low grade, where it's less than 50% of the thickness, and higher grade when it's greater than 50% of the thickness. The findings here, that both may be symptomatic, uh, the few papers that have looked into this suggest that the low grade should not be repaired, where some high grade and highly symptomatic patients may benefit from repair if it's a high grade partial tear. So, and then other. I, I, I'm John. I, I think it depends on the symptoms. Yes. And, and like you said, if you do exercises, um, uh, and you you exercise the proper muscles to, to try to bring the shoulder um, and the head of the humerus down um, instead of having it go up and, and, and uh, pinch, pinch the bursa uh, and whatever else. Um, you get rid of the pain doing that. Uh, when I get symptoms, I... I um, um, bring my shoulder back uh, as far as I can and and hold that for five seconds or so and do that uh, a few times and the pain goes away. I, I'm, I can't explain it, probably taking the pressure off the yeah. uh, shoulder from going up. Uh, notice that the old guys on this talk are not saying if I get a tear or pain, it's when I get a tear or pain. Uh, whereas the, the younger people here wouldn't say that. But uh, the other thing we know, as I saw in the, in the Katie Barrick study we talked about before, is there's a very high prevalence of rotator cuff tears in older individuals. I've, I've seen the older guys crying. Yeah. Um, and the, the shoulders is uh, so painful. I've had one an individual that I operated twice and I couldn't do anything for him and uh, couldn't get rid of the pain. I had to use pain medication till, till he died. Wow, amazing. So the other types of partial tears include the pasta lesion. The name came from uh, Steve Schneider in the Valley, uh, which is called partial articular surface tendon avulsions, and that's where as Michael was referring to, you have a partial tear of the joint side uh, distal tendon, and then just the joint side portion of the tendon retracts uh, approximately. The uh, bursal side stays intact. And then paint, which is partial thickness articular surface intratendinous tear, uh, which you can see in overhead athletes. And here the, the foot plate is intact. So this is a tear. Uh, the posta lesions, the tear is typically a partial tear at the insertion on the bone. The paint lesions are more uh, proximal tears, not at the insertion into the bone. Okay, let's see. Who's next? Uh, Ash, you, uh, what do you think of this case? All right, so um, this is a 23-year-old baseball pitcher, weakness for four months, no trauma except for baseball um, looks like the supraspinatus is pretty atrophied um, looking at the uh, the set uh, this, this um, coronal image and the axial image looks pretty atrophy supraspinatus I don't um, yeah it looks very atrophied um, on the sagittal view um, and I don't know if there's I don't see any mass or abnormality there 
Yeah, this patient didn't have any uh, uh, periarticular cysts, certainly not in the suprascapular notch, as you might expect. So why this occurs uh, isn't clear, but especially in overhead athletes, especially baseball players, uh, especially baseball pitchers, it's not uncommon for us occasionally in high, these high-level athletes to actually see uh, focal supraspinatus muscle atrophy. Supraspinatus isn't the most common. I think in my experience, by far the most common is isolated infraspinatus atrophy. I think I'll show some examples of that in Major League Baseball pictures. Uh, is, is, is this a neuro, neurogenic, this, this case, John? Well, uh, I don't know in this particular case. In a lot of these, we don't know. The presumption is that it's neurogenic and that it's somewhere either from trauma to the nerve that's not been recognized, or maybe in the past there were, there were periarticular cysts that compressed the suprascapular nerve, which have now resolved for whatever reason, uh, but the, or maybe there is just some injury to, to the, to the uh, nerve going into the muscle that didn't affect the, the tendon. Uh, these, these occur. And as you can see, the rest of the muscles are very well developed here. And the interesting thing is that uh, some of these people can be very high-end athletes uh, and have profound atrophy of a single muscle like this. It's, uh, uh, again, the, the infraspinatus, in my experience, is the most common. Just, just be aware of it. And there's really not anything to be done about it, as long as there's not a cyst. Okay, Jennifer. It's a 31 year old male with pain after a weightlifting injury. Um, let's see, I do see some increased signal intensity within the supraspinatus footprint. So this could be represent some tendinosis. Yes. And then there is some fluid signal there along the superior aspect of the musculotendinous junction. It almost looks like there could be some retracted bursal fibers or perhaps just, yes, right there. Maybe it's just some muscle strain. I'd have to look at the insertion. Okay. So here I just see edema in the muscle, um, so muscle strain. Mm-hmm. That's not that common to see, but uh, certainly in athletes, that's something you have to you have to be very well aware of. Uh, Michael, uh, so we see a kind of increased signal, maybe some swelling, kind of in the superior, uh, in the supraspinatus at the myotendinous junction. I don't see like a definite tear. Um, so this again could also be kind of muscular strain. There, there is some, yeah, it's probably just strain. Okay. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Looks like there's increased signal. Oh. Oh, uh, are we on the coronal imaging? There's definitely increased signal here. Um, is this? Are we looking at the infraspinatus here? A lot of increased signal. Um, I don't know if this is a muscle strain. And it's known as edema. Yeah. 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 So this is a, another grade one partial tear of the uh, infras. This one. This time it's the infraspinatus tendon. Jennifer, what about this patient? So here we can also see increased signal intensity within the infraspinatus compatible with muscle strain. And there's that focal fluid signal intensity cleft there at the musculotendinous junction. It looks like there may be a partial thickness tear at the musculotendinous junction. And there's a grade two fatty atrophy of the infraspinatus. It's all just related to edema. Strain of the subscap as well here. This patient. Okay. Yeah, it 
looks like we have pretty a 38 year old male shoulder pain limitation motion after lifting injury. Looks like we have pretty good um, fatty atrophy of the teres minor, kind of isolated. Um, and there's maybe some increased signal within it on the PD fat set. And yeah, and again, we see some fatty atrophy of the teres minor. So you'd want to make sure there's just not like a quadrilateral space occupying mass. Uh, individual muscles. So it must be some kind of an injury that they get to the nerve, probably from weightlifting, I would guess, because these tend to be in uh, weightlifters with uh, all the other muscles very large, just from uh, overdoing it. Okay, uh, Ashu. Um, well, oh, on the next one. All right, so we have the Terry's minor. Uh, some increased signal within the teres minor. It looks kind of atrophied. I don't know if this is a partial tear yeah. or if it's just edema. Yeah, this was an acute uh, grade one tear of the uh, of the teres minor. Jennifer. Mm. So here it looks like we're up slightly higher, so this should be the infraspinatus, and there's some increased fluid signal intensity along the bursal surface. It looks like there's a partial thickness tear. So we're going to talk about muscle and how to grade it. There are a bunch of different grading systems for muscle tears. One that's commonly used is uh, if you have a lot of edema, especially if you get this kind of feather appearance, uh, that would be kind of grade one. If you have focal fluid collection or hematoma in the muscle, that would be a grade two. And then a complete tear uh, uh, is, a, is a grade three. So that's, that's kind of in. Uh, there are uh, more sophisticated systems for, for some athletes that tend to correlate better with uh, the time it takes to return to play that we'll talk about when we get to muscles. But most people use just grade one, two, and three. And this would be kind of a high grade, grade one. Uh, tear of the uh, teres minor in this patient. Okay, so 17-year-old female pain after fall. So there's quite a bit of edema and irregularity involving the teres minor. So I assume this is at least a partial thickness tear of the teres minor. Looks more than just a strain. And yeah, it looks like it's retracted, like this might be close to complete tear. So what is this? Oh, uh, that's is that a piece of like cortex, like an avulsion? Okay. So, so that's uh, and that's very important to pick up because if you have a tear of the muscle, it's non-surgical. But an avulsion injury of the bone or even just a tear of the of a tendon, not a muscle at the attachment to the bone would make it surgical, uh, but this is a bony avulsion, which makes it a surgical case. John, do you want to comment on that? Um, I, I've never really treated a, a single uh, tear uh, of um, teres minor. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I would operate on it. Okay. Ashu, uh, what do you think of this? Here we can see intersubstance fluid within the supraspinatus at the myotendinous junction. I think this is an interstitial tear at the very least. Okay. Yeah, this is a partial tear right at the muscular tendinous junction. Good. Arthur Graham, someone with an acute injury. Yeah, I, I wouldn't operate on that. So here we can see some mild articular surface irregularity of the supraspinatus. I'd either call this a mild articular surface fraying or mild bursal surface tearing. And here we can see just trace fluid signal intensity extending along the proximal fibers. Well, no, that's, that's, not, that's not even close to being 50% um, a tear. So no, that 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 you just um, um, teach an exercise program and that let the patient uh, work on it. Yeah. I'm not a great believer in, in the physical therapy. I'm 
I'm more of a guy that uh, tells the patient what to do and uh, let them do it. Um, because I look at the bills, especially recently in my wife's bills, uh, 300 bucks a visit, you know, uh, it, it becomes a little, um, a little steep. And if you look at people who have workman comp injuries, typically the physical therapy bill will be about 10 times what the imaging bill is. Uh, you, you got that right. Uh, um, I had three stents put in and um, each each stent cost $15,000. And to make it, uh, it cost like $150. Oh my God. And so the insurance, um, uh, got a 10% discount and they were happy about it. Oh my God. And, and I was really ticked off about it. Wow. And this was in Palm Desert Eisenhower. Wow. Uh, 15,000 bucks for a $150 stent. It's a pretty big markup. That's a, and, and that's not for surgery, that's just for the stent. Wow, that's amazing. And, and that was in 1988. Okay, so is this a arthrogram? Or is that just a PD facet on the... Okay, because it looks like there's, you know, there's a either arthrogram or joint effusion. There's a little defect in the undersurface of the supraspinatus at the kind of myotendinous junction. I'm guessing that's what it's asking if that's a tear. That is, yes. Which is this. Uh-huh. Yeah. And is this a tear? Is that what it's asking? So this, some other text oh, so it looks like there's like a direct. Oh, is this from surgery? Is this like a portal? The right. This is actually a portal. So they poked, that's where the scope went through the. Yeah. Okay. That partial tear. That was the arthroscopic. Good. I'll just be aware of that. And here we have uh, an acute muscular tendinous junction tear and, and an athlete. Right at the... Okay, uh, Ashu. All right, so here we're looking at a 14 year old with acute pain. Um, I honestly think there's, a, there's just increased signal here at the distal. Um, uh, Superspinatus foot, but I think it's just tendinosis, pretty pretty moderate tendinosis. But, but he's a young kid. Why would a 14 year old have tendinosis? Hmm. Is he a baseball player? I, I don't know. Let's see here, does he have some deposits? Is that low signal? No. no. I don't think so. No. He actually no. has acute injury. This is actually not tendinosis, but an acute tendon strain. Yeah. Uh, looking at it, it looks like fluid, uh, doesn't it? The, the tendinosis would not uh, look like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, it's a little bit yeah. of configuration, the typical tendinosis, but if this were a 50 year old, I would call it tendinosis. But in 14, this turned out just to be an, an acute strain of the tendon and it healed just fine. Yeah, acute like, like edema. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer. Here I can see some mild increased signal intensity kind of in the crescent of the supraspinatus, but it seems like the articular and bursal sided fibers are intact. So this may be a small partial thickness interstitial tear or just some tendinosis. Yeah, tendinosis. Arthroscopically, it was normal. Okay, so this is... Again, wouldn't that be uh, an edema, John? Uh, it, it could be edema, but I think this is just going to be tendinosis from that mechanism we talked about of chronic micro tears with a granulation tissue developing trying to heal it rather than true extracellular increased fluid. 
And the, the reason he has a, a, a good muscle size and um, this area is very, very small. Um, and that, that's what makes me think that uh, this is just a um, partial injury, i.e. strain like type type one. That's possible. Uh, but uh, you, you have a hell of a lot more experience with this than I do, so. Yeah, I, I don't remember all the details. I think this patient did not have an acute injury, uh, but, but I don't remember the details. Hey, so um, it looks like there's increased uh, signal kind of in the similar position in the supraspinatus tendon, kind of mid-substance. Um, so I don't know if this and it's arthrogram, and it's, it looks like on this, I don't know if we need to window it, but it looks like there's signal within it, like almost contrasting. So this, we didn't see any black line here. And at arthroscopy, there was a large partial tear here. Uh, so this was a partial tear. And, you know, it does look like a partial tear on the T2. But we had a couple come in on this particular study that, that looked like this. So the PD fat set when you window it properly is uh, the, the better technique to look for these partial tears, but you have to window it properly to make sure you don't have a thin line here. Okay, I'll shoot. All right, so 27 year old MLB pitcher with increasing posterior axillary pain after pitching rule out Terry's major or latissimus tear. Um, just looking at this, I think we're looking at the supraspinatus here. Um, there is uh, some traction changes at the footprint, uh, so the insertion there. So the teres major and latissimus dorsi were fine, but you're mm -hmm. right, we're seeing some traction changes here. Notice the inferior surface of the tendon looks intact. So this really looks like a, uh, a chronic avulsion injury to the bone at the supraspinatus insertion. This was marked 4.2209. The, the thing is, uh, uh, at, at this point in time, uh, the area of latissimus dorsi or teres major is not in, uh, not even in sight. Right. I don't. I didn't show those images. The, the, those images were normal, John. Okay. So uh, obviously, uh, in, when they say rule out teres major and 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 that this was Dorsey, and that's uh, their way off. off uh, that's down here, right? Yeah, right. But the, but the uh, this would be supraspinatus, if anything. It is, that's right. So this was on 42209. Uh, he continued to work out, and uh, about a month later, this is what it looked like. Well, now we see that there is a tearing at the footprint on the, and there's some also some tearing along the articular sided fibers of the supraspinatus. Um, I think it's a partial tear. I think there's some intact fibers, um, but that that traction change, that cyst that was there before, is now opened up into a tear. Yeah. So I think what happened with him, and he had kind of an acute event here, is he, this bone was weakened here, and then you actually got an avulsion injury of the deep fibers of the supraspinatus, kind of like a pasta type injury, where you actually, the, the bone failed, the muscle retracted and tore, the tendon retracted and tore. So now we, we actually have this cyst communicating with the joint space, uh, with this arthrogram, the contrast is going into it, and we now have the development of a new uh, partial tear all along the joint side surface of the supraspinatus tendon, and this just happened acutely. And we can see some bone edema here from the traction injury. If you look at the muscle, the supraspinatus, it's huge. And uh, it's actually um, abutting against um, a, a chromion. Uh, 
right um and and so the the, the pressure on that uh on on that tendon is uh, uh, quite substantial and i don't know what kind of exercises he was doing but whatever he was doing it was a wrong exercise yeah. for, for his problem he was a major league baseball pitcher well there you go that's the wrong exercise <laughs> right <laughs> So here I can see some increased signal intensity in the supraspinatus. It's thickened, compatible with tendinosis. Um, there may be some fluid signal intensity along that musculotendinous junction. I can't tell. And yes, there's some traction changes in the greater tuberosity. And then here we can see, again, the tendinosis, but the bursal and articular surface fibers are intact. So, these, as we know, especially at the intraspinatus insertion, these traction cysts are extremely common. In fact, I'm sure that well over half of the MR scans we do have traction injuries at the intraspinatus insertion. I bet it's 80 to 90 percent. Uh, uh, and these are typically associated with loss of the cortex here, probably from traction fractures uh, in that location. And they're commonly associated with tendinosis and interstitial tears. Uh, from that look, you lose the normal fixation of the tendon, and therefore the tendon contracts, and you get these interstitial shearing forces that cause interstitial tears. John, is, is that would you say that this is a, a tendinosis with a small tear of the foot plate? I would. Supramural dance structure with increasing shoulder pain when you're after fall. The first thing I notice is there's really prominent traction cystic changes in that near the intraspinatus insertion. Um, and now I'm seeing that there's some increased signal in the kind of infraspinatus, supraspinatus conjoint tendon near the footprint. Yeah. But I don't see a discrete tear. So this is a indication of these chronic traction injuries. Uh, three things can produce problems here, but we'll talk about the other two later. Uh, uh, but this this is the most common, and these are typically uh, kind of little rounded cysts, fairly sharply martinated, though there's a little bit of bone edema. This is, there's some acute on top of chronic injury here, and these are due to the traction changes. So this is six, eight, 14, the patient came back uh, almost a year later, and this is what it looked like. Okay, so a year later, it looks like it's become more progressive. There's actually more bone loss with more cystic change and a little bit more, edema, uh, quite a bit more edema as well. The area, the tendons themselves, I think, still look grossly intact, all the tendinotic. So this is just progressive traction injury. So if you keep doing the same thing, the injury pattern is going to increase uh, over time, right? Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? All right, 17-year-old male with new onset shoulder pain, labral tear, or bicep subluxation. So we're looking at the supraspinatus, and on the PD fat set, it looks like there's a quite a bit of a articular sided tearing, um, and I see some delamination with retracted tendon fibers up into the superior joint space. Um, and then on the T2, it, it's not as bright as I would expect, but um, I still I still think there's a quite a I think there's given that there's delamination, I still think there's a uh, at least moderate to high grade uh, partial thickness articular sided tear with delamination. Okay, and so this is the uh, Snyder's pasta lesion. Okay. Okay, so here we can see on the T1 images that there's some mild thickening within the supraspinatus, and I need to look at the T2 to look at those articular sided fibers. So here we can see that there's high grade partial thickness articular surface tearing of the supraspinatus, and the bursal sided fibers are intact. <laughs> So, 
it looks like we have some linear uh, fluid signal in the supraspinatus tendon. I, I think that there's intact articular and bursal situs fibers, so this could be, I think, a longitudinal interstitial tearing, kind of low grade. Here, on the coronal of the PD fat set, we've got a lot of signal going up down to the inferior surface. Mm -hmm. There's the axial. Do you think it's come, all our articular surface fibers are involved? Uh, this patient actually never had arthroscopy, so I don't have a definitive answer on this. But uh, this would be a, a high-grade partial tear of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, Ashu? Uh, I'd Can recommend we... a different kind of exercise for that patient. <laughs> But he won't get paid as much if he does something else. I know. It's, uh, it's, 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 you? Um, I think uh, the articular sided fibers, they look tendinotic, but I don't see a tear there. I think that there might be some bursal sided tearing uh, of the supraspinatus here. You um, know, you, uh, you can get longitudinal tears. Uh, the tears are not all transverse. Yeah, well, well, uh, we'll see. there are all kinds of directions um, of, a, of a tear in a, in a shoulder, uh, a rotator cuff. It, 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 it's not just a transverse or longitudinal. And they're L-shaped tears and all different, all different kind of tears, inner body tears. So, so, so this was read by a different radiologist, and the surgeon called me up fuming after the patient went to surgery. This was called a tear, and this is what it looked like. Uh, but when they went to surgery, the cuff was completely normal. So uh, he called up uh, complaining that we had a false positive that led the patient uh, to unnecessary surgery. And this is really a high-grade, near-full thickness partial tear uh, but it did not go through the joint side surface, so the arthroscopist couldn't see it. So I think a lot of you already have had me say, when you see situations like this where you see a large uh, partial tear, but it doesn't clearly go through the articular surface, to make sure you word it in a way where the surgeon knows that it may not go all the way through to the joint side surface, even though it's a high-grade partial tear. So that if they uh, do have surgery, that they're not confused. Again, fortunately, this was read by another radiologist and not me, uh, but uh, we were able to calm down the surgeon to explain him what was happening. These, according to a, num a number of reports, can still be very symptomatic, and this is one of those kind of lesions which some people feel in highly symptomatic patients, they do better with uh, a repair of these, even though they may not go all the way through the surface. And then, and this it's, it's very hard to put a scope into an area like this um, and then and, and if you just don't get the right portal you're not going to get a, a good visualization yeah. so yeah. It, it, I think the surgeon um, uh, may have missed a boat here yeah. uh, well I think it's just kind of a kind of a miscommunication and notice that there's also severe atrophy of the deltoid, which also... Yeah, not, not only that, but you also have longitudinal tearing um, um, in, a, in the muscle portion of this yeah. uh, right. shoulder. Yeah, and, and here's a more severe example of a longitudinal tear that, that John's talking about. Here, there's a tear that goes to the joint side surface, but it doesn't go through the... The tendon, like John was saying, is going longitudinally between the fibers, proximally, in this case, into the supraspinatus, but the vast majority of these will actually track back into the infraspinatus where they can have large uh, fluid collections. So why don't we stop here, and we'll continue to talk about uh, uh, different kinds of partial tears and go on to full thickness tears uh, next uh, talk. We probably won't have lecture on Thursday. Uh, uh, so again, our next lecture will probably be on Friday, but I'll let everybody know. Thanks. Well, every, everybody have a great two days. Thanks, John. Thank you. Dr. Goodis.
Take care. Great. Why, John? I was going to say, I have a hell of a lot of um, fruit here, John. Uh, Thanks, John. My, 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 my tree is going to fall over if I don't get it picked. Uh, well, let me talk to Melinda and we'll get back to you. I just drive by and uh, we'll fill your sack full of fruit and then we can go home. Yeah, and like the, the problem is that she doesn't, she doesn't know what to do when she has a lot of it because she doesn't use that much citrus. But let me talk to her and see what fr Freeze it up in a freezer. Okay, thanks. You bet.